I played every Naruto Clash of Ninja game. Part 2. This is the second part of a two-part series where I play every Naruto Clash of Ninja game. While you can watch this without having seen the previous video, I will be referencing that video quite a bit here, at least at the beginning, so I do recommend watching that one first. Before I get into it, I really want to thank my patrons, including Melancholus in the Omega Gamer tier, and that's just Ash and Megan Luke Skywalker mug in the Played Every Game tier, along with all of these absolutely legendary people on your screen. Thank you so much for the support. All Alright, let's get into the games. Naruto Clash of Ninja Revolution 2 was released for the Wii in 2008. This is the final game in the series to be set before Shippuden, at least content-wise. Oh my god, we actually have a real functional menu. While some of the ordering is still not quite how I'd personally order it, this is a massive improvement. A neat little touch in the menu is how the images change depending on the mode. Like in the Versus mode, the visual changes depending on how many players you're selecting for the mode. It's a subtle change, but it definitely elevates this UI design way above any previous entry for me. Other visual changes are pretty subtle, but I do want to note that it looks like the effects got a bit of an upgrade like Naruto's Ninetales aura, or the lightning around Sharingan mode Sasuke or Kakashi. I would also say that the special moves are a lot smoother, and I think this game is the first game to really start competing with the Ultimate Ninja games with the special move presentation. It's not quite the same level of craziness, but it's pretty close, and I enjoyed watching a lot of the moves here. In fact, I wish this game had a dedicated special move viewer like a few of the Ultimate Ninja games did. Before I continue, I just need to say, Clash of Ninja Revolution 2 and 3 are incredibly grindy. Unlocking stuff in these games takes a ridiculous amount of just playing matches over and over and over again. I know that this is seen as a plus for some people, but still, I feel like it needs to be pointed out because I'm not a big fan of grinding. Anyways, gameplay-wise, this game expands on the gameplay of Revolution 1 while also implementing both Gekito Ninja Tyson 4 stuff and a pretty major new mechanic. First, the tag-out system from Gekito Ninja Tyson 4 is back, but this time you can only have up to two characters per team. This isn't bad though, and the higher-paced fights are still here. Having a tertiary character didn't make the experience any better though, so I do think that two is a good number. On top of that, there's a new major mechanic in Paper Bombs. Using a special button input, you can either throw or place down Paper Bombs. When you throw them, they work like the normal throwables, but they ignore guards and stagger the opponent completely. You can also place them down, which is essentially just a trap for the opponent. This is neat though, because it means that you have to think for a second before just rushing into the opponent blindly. When you run over a paper bomb, it's the same stagger effect and you're completely open for a follow-up combo. There's one other kind of gameplay change, and that's the hand signs. Apparently you can use the Wii Remote and the Nunchuck during fights to kind of waggle and make hand signs for abilities and chakra bonuses, but again, that feels kinda gimmicky, so I just stuck with the tried and true trusty game. GameCube controller. Oh, and one last thing. I don't know if this was in the last game and I just missed it or if it's new to this game, but during stage transitions, you can actually choose to attack enemies. On top of that, it looks like every stage pretty much has transitions now, which is a great touch and it makes every stage feel more fun and dynamic to play. Overall, for gameplay though, I really like the faster feeling pace here. These games have never felt slow or anything, but the character switching is definitely a welcome improvement. The modes in this game are broken down a little bit differently thanks to some UI improvements. There's story mode, the versus mode, training, and extras. First, I'm gonna talk about the versus mode, since they're not all technically standard versus modes. When you select the versus mode menu, you're given one through four player modes, and a spectator mode, which is the CPU versus CPU mode. Inside, the two through four player modes are a mixture of versus and co-op modes based on the one player modes. The one player modes are mission list, player versus CPU, score attack, time attack, survival, kumite, and multi-match. Mission List, which is just a standard mission mode, has a lot of missions that can be attempted by any of the characters. Once you beat a mission, you're given a rank based on your performance, and that rank shows up in the mission list on a per-character basis. What's cool about some of these missions is that some of them have specific matchup enemies depending on what character you choose, like these rival missions. This means that for most of the matchups, you actually get that character's specific rival and some character-specific dialogue, which is pretty neat. Something I never expected from this mission mode was that while there's only a handful of missions, they still 
feel more fun and fair because they tell you outright what their difficulty is and exactly what you're getting yourself into. If anything, this is how they should have done the story mode. Break it down into missions and give the win requirements. Stick the cutscenes in between. I would have wholeheartedly preferred that to what we got, but I'm getting ahead of myself. All of the following modes have either a one versus one or tag in option. Player versus CPU is the standard versus match with either a two man squad or a one versus one match. Score attack is a mode where you fight 10 matches against an assortment of CPUs aiming to get the highest score, which seems to be based on the number of hits and remaining HP per battle. Time attack mode is the same concept, but the goal is to win as fast as possible. Survival mode works the same as previous games. You fight as many battles as you can for as long as you can, with your HP only restoring a little bit between each round. With survival mode, I actually wanted to point out that this game is the first game in my experience with a really good survival mode. The difficulty slowly ramps up in a way that makes sense, whereas in previous games it almost felt like the difficulty just stayed at the lowest baseline difficulty the entire time. I really felt challenged here, and the addition of the tag-in character made it way more interesting too. Kumiten mode is like a slightly altered version of the Obero mode which we saw in previous games. In this, you're fighting wave after wave of enemies, but their number increases over time, meaning that eventually you're swarmed by a bunch of enemies all at the same time. I actually like this mode more because it almost feels like you're playing like the super light Dynasty Warriors-esque mode mixed with some Tekken Force. I enjoy this mode quite a bit. Finally, there's Multi-Match, which is just a customizable version of mob battles. You can select up to four characters to participate and break them into either everyone for themselves or into teams. Now on to the Story Mode. Story Mode here has a massive presentation upgrade above all previous games. Not only do we get both the visual novel style cutscenes and the big static artwork scenes, we also get a vast majority of the scenes with actual 3D models involved. Sure, they just stand around most of the time, but I really like this since it makes the framing of the scenes make a lot more sense. On top of that, this story is a completely original story rather than an adaptation of the final arc of the normal story. In this story, an invader has put a bunch of the hidden leaf under a sort of mind control genjutsu that causes them to attack their allies. This leads to some pretty interesting character interactions. While I do think it's a shame that Clash of Ninja ends up not actually adapting the final arc of Naruto, it is still cool that we got something original here. However, here's where I tell you the unfortunate reason as to why I, at the end of the day, do not like this game's story mode. The fights in every game so far have felt fair for the most part. Even in the last video when I complained about the CPUs reading your inputs, the fights were still technically fair as the CPU could be outsmarted and beaten with some clever movement and usage of the game's mechanics. In this game though, they decided to just, I don't know, do away with fair fights? At certain points in the story, some of the enemies that you fight in this game just have a completely unfair advantage, or multiple unfair advantages. The main one being the inability to be staggered. See, when you get hit in this game, you're staggered or hit stunned meaning that you're locked into a combo unless you use a substitution. Unless you use a substitution, you're going to take full damage from that combo. Here though, there are some enemies who, if you hit them, they can just completely ignore the hits and break your combos. They don't flinch, they don't stagger, they don't get hit stunned at all, and they're also way more aggressive than the AI normally is, making some of these fights ridiculously difficult for absolutely no reason other than to seemingly waste your time retrying the fight over and over again. I can't cannot stand this kind of thing. Sometimes they even require you to finish off the enemy with specific moves, meaning that you occasionally get put into this impossible situation where you can't take any more hits so you need your substitution, but if you use your substitution, you can't use the special move that the mission requires, meaning that you'll probably lose anyways. I know a lot of people probably like this story mode, and outside of this, I actually also like this story mode, but I just don't see why they had to go and ruin it like this. These fights just aren't fun to me at all. Anyway, Anyways, I don't want to linger on why I don't like this mode for too long, because the game itself is good, the gameplay's fun, and there's good stuff here. They just really missed the mark with this story mode thanks to that one little thing they did to ruin it for me. Anyways, overall, I'm feeling a bit mixed on this game. The changes and additions were all improvements, but the story mode just soured the whole thing for me. The variety of modes here was nice though, and I think the gameplay is just getting better and better as time goes on. Let's see how the final Revolution game stacks up. 
Naruto Shippuden Clash of Ninja Revolution 3 was released for the Wii in 2009. This is the final Clash of Ninja game released outside of Japan, meaning that it's the only Shippuden Clash of Ninja game the West got. Visually, this game is about the same as Revolution 2, and there's not a whole lot more I can say about it. It looks good, and I'm not really expecting any huge changes to the aesthetic this late in the series. The models look good, the characters look good, and the effects are solid. Gameplay-wise, this game, again, builds off of the previous game. Something specific I want to note, though, is that this this game actually feels a lot more fresh than the last few, because with the time skip, many of the characters now have brand new combos, and they feel a little bit different to play, which is a huge improvement to me. Believe it or not, some of the main cast were using a nearly identical moveset since the first Clash of Ninja all the way up to this point. The characters just feel better to use this time around. The combos are a lot flashier, and the animations are, in my opinion, of higher quality. According to what I've read online, there's a ton of mechanical changes under the hood in this game, as far as, like, the balance goes like with frame windows and all that kind of stuff, but I'm a pretty casual player, so I wouldn't even know how to describe them, let alone be able to, I don't know, compare them. Something else that I read was that there was supposed to have been an addition to the stage transitions. According to what I read online, the transitions are supposed to work two ways now, where you can, I guess, transition again after the first one, but I couldn't get that to work at all, and I tried every stage. I mean, there could be some kind of user error here, I guess, but I never encountered this at all while playing this, even after I went into the training mode to try to force it. So the modes in this game are, well, nearly identical to the ones in the previous game. In fact, the only new mode here that I can see is the online mode, not counting the shop. So rather than rehash every mode I've already covered, I'll just talk about some highlights. For starters, the story mode returns and covers the first arc of Shippuden. Notably, this story mode is quite a bit less frustrating than the previous story mode, which is fantastic. It's almost entirely made up of the 3D cutscenes, but still fully voiced. I think it's perfectly fine, and I enjoyed playing it. I did have two things I wanted to point out specifically, though. First, there's a fight where you're Guy, and you have to fight a clone of Guy. This fight is very fun to me, because the clone mirrors your control inputs exactly, and you kind of have to come up with a creative way of defeating him. It's a pretty interesting concept for a fight, and not something that I've seen many games, or really any other game in my experience, do before. However, I also wanted to address the Chio fights. Chio uses these puppets to fight, and while it's a really cool mechanic on paper, it leads to some really big issues with the camera control. Chiyo's moveset is really creative and has attacks from each puppet controlled by both attack buttons. However, once the puppets get separated from her, it becomes really difficult to understand their relationship to her, and by extension the opponent, in 3D space. This means that you end up just kind of having to button mash in this fight. It's not the most egregious issue though, and I'd still take this over the ridiculously unbalanced fights from the last game. Of course, there are still the requisite one or two fights with a dramatic difficulty spike, but that's also something that we've seen before in this series. The story mode, overall, is exactly what I've come to expect from this series, and the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's a perfectly serviceable story mode, and I enjoyed my time with it. So for the first time in the Western releases, there's online play under the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection. In this menu, there's Wi-Fi battle mode, player data, friend roster, and rival roster. I wasn't able to do the online matches, though, unfortunately, but the other modes just allow you to see various data. I won't link too much on the online mode, but it is nice that it's here. This game brings back the shop mode, meaning that unlocks are all done through earning currency from playing other modes. Even the story mode gives you currency after every fight, which is actually really nice. Unfortunately, like I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the video, the grind really does rear its head here. These games are just super grindy if you want to unlock everything. I mean, it'd be less fun if you unlocked everything in like, I don't know, an hour, but it can feel kind of excessive. I guess it's still better than microtransactions, though. I'm sort of torn on whether or not I like the shop or just unlocking things randomly better. While unlocking things randomly can feel rewarding, at least with the shop you know exactly how much you need to grind to get the thing you want. At the same time, knowing how much you need to grind might lead to even faster burnout. Still, maybe the shop is a better way of doing this in the long run, but I don't know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments, is a shop better or is unlocking things randomly through other modes better? Anyways, as the send-off for the Clash of Ninja series in the West, I think this game is a fine game to do it with. The systems feel like a natural evolution of the systems the series has established up to this point, and I think that overall, it's a great game. The only thing I wish it had was the option to play as pre-time skip characters. I know that this would essentially double the roster for basically no reason, but I don't see any reason to not have those characters since they're already there anyways. I know, it's not as easy as just bringing them over, but if there ever were another Clash of Ninja game in the future, which I think there should be, I would love to see this. 
Naruto Shippuden Gekito Ninja Taisen EX was released on the Wii in 2006, exclusively in Japan. So here's where the timeline gets a little bit confusing. While the West was getting the Revolution series, Japan was getting Gekito Ninja Taisen EX. These releases were happening in parallel, and some of the games took features from others, and they basically piggybacked off of each other. Because of this, I probably won't be spending as much time on each entry, and instead focusing on what makes each one unique, as most of the new features are going to be things that we've actually seen before. So visually, you probably noticed, this game goes back to the 4-3 non-widescreen aspect ratio, but to be fair, we did just jump back to 2006. The graphics look just as good as ever though. Gameplay-wise, this feels really similar to the jump from Clash of Ninja to Clash of Ninja Revolution. The stage obstacles and the stage transitions are here, but notably there are no paper bombs in any of the EX games. But based on the timelines of release and the features in these games, it looks like for the most part, Revolution would take features that were introduced in the EX games, and they kind of just piggybacked from there. Something weird that this game does is kind of force the weird special move Wii Remote Waggle on you, even if you're using a GameCube controller. In the settings, you can change the input to button inputs, and I think just using the sticks does the trick here, but I definitely would prefer just being able to disable this entirely. Story mode in this game covers through most of the Kazakage rescue arc from Shippuden, which we also saw in Revolution 3. Yeah, the first game in this series covers the same material as the final game from the Revolution series. I assume because the West was behind on the anime, so it probably made a lot more sense at the time, but I don't know. Looking at this story mode versus Revolution 3's, this one uses 2D artwork exclusively to tell the story, rather than using the 3D models, and honestly, I'm kinda here for it. It's pretty cool seeing the same story told in two different ways through what is essentially the same series like this, and I imagine that this isn't an experience you could usually have with a lot of other game series. I do like this presentation a lot, and I think there's more artwork than even the last time we saw this style used. This game also has the minigame mode, but these are the exact same minigames from Clash of Ninja Revolution 1, just with the Shippuden versions of the characters. Otherwise, they're identical. This is kind of an interesting peek into how much the developer put into trying to give both the Japanese and Western audiences the same features just in different games. The fact that they went out of their way to adapt it this way actually makes me gain a lot of respect for them. Overall though, this really does feel a lot like the first Revolution game feature-wise, just with Shippuden characters. I enjoyed my time with it, but I'm gonna be honest, I didn't spend all that much time with it after playing through the story mode. At this point in the series, I'm really just looking for new and interesting things, or just different things. Naruto Shippuden Gekito Ninja Taisen EX2 was released for the Wii in 2007. This game is, uh, basically just the last game I just covered. Like, I'm talking, this game feels like they just updated the story mode and removed the minigames. I know that a lot more probably went into it, but it really does feel like something you'd see in, I don't know, an expansion update in a modern game, just packaged by itself. The story mode in this one is almost identical in presentation to the previous one and covers up until around the Tenchi Bridge arc. Unfortunately, half the story mode is just the Kaze Kage rescue arc once again, though. At this point, I do think these games would benefit from the Ultimate Ninja style of storytelling, where the next game picks up from where the last game left off. But I also understand that these games were probably adapting as much as they could up to where the story was, at least in the anime. Something the story mode does that sets it apart from previous ones is the occasional story choice between what character you want to use in certain missions. While this doesn't overall affect the story mode too much, it is nice to give you some player agency here rather than to force you to use a specific character. Also, this guy versus guy fight returns, so I guess technically now I have seen it before. You also get the option to do another clone fight with the character of your choice, so that's kind of cool too. I will say though that doing one of these fights one after another kind of almost makes it feel like it overstays its welcome, but just almost. One fun thing about this game is the addition of pre-time skip Naruto and Sasuke in the versus modes. This is something I mentioned previously wanting, and while it's not for everyone, I'll still take it. I imagine that they were brought over from Revolution since it was released around the same time as this game, and the work of getting the characters into this engine was already done. One thing I did notice that's kind of weird though is that it's almost like their character models stretch and get bigger when they're not just standing. Just take a look at this. His body is definitely longer than it was when he was standing, right? I know why they did this, but it still kind of looks hilarious. Finally, unless I somehow missed this in the last game, this game brought back the gallery mode, which lets you view all of the images from the story mode. While I am a bit indifferent on unlocking things that we've already seen, it doesn't hurt to have options. Overall, I think I can use that same word to 
describe how I felt about this game. Just indifferent. I don't feel like it added anything significant to the series, and it really just felt like a stepping stone. Let's hope EX3 brings something new to the table. Naruto Shippuden Gekito Ninja Taisen EX3 was released for the Wii in 2008. Alright, so while all of these games had pretty decent intro videos, this one goes especially hard, and I wanted to call special attention to it. This is a really cool intro. So yeah, presentation-wise, this game again, it's very similar to EX2, and by extension, EX1. In fact, I've been showing you the main menu for EX2 this whole time. This is the main menu for EX3. Gotcha! This actually brings me to a point that I'm trying to make. The Revolution games were pretty similar across each game, but they also shook up the presentation a bit across the series too. These games are comfortable just, I guess, reusing assets for the presentation, and while I can't knock them for not wanting to make new UI elements from scratch every time, especially when these releases were only a year apart, I think I would feel a little bit burned if I had just put a bunch of time into EX2, waited a year for the new game, and then launched it for the first time to see that it was functionally identical, at least at first glance. Anyways, now that I've done that whole rant, let's take a look at this game's story mode that is completely different from anything this series has ever done before. That's right, this is a third-person beat-em-up that almost feels like a Dynasty Warriors game. The controls are similar to the controls in the normal fights, but the jump button is bound to the right trigger, and the left trigger centers the camera. Speaking of the camera, it cannot be manually moved, not even with the C-Stick on the GameCube controller. You can click in the trigger to center it behind you, but that's it. There's not even a lock-on button to keep it focused on any specific enemy, and that does make this feel a bit janky to play sometimes. Otherwise though, this really is a breath of fresh air. The playable characters all seem to have movesets similar to their standard ones, but with some adjustments to make them work in this new gameplay style. The goal is to defeat enemies as you make your way to the mission objective area. You can run around freely and, if you want, ignore enemies as they pile up behind you since the game seems to only be able to render a handful at a time. The maps are all gigantic mazes and you end up spending a bunch of time just kind of figuring out where to go while inevitably just running past most of the enemies because you got bored, at least if you're anything like me. In one mission though, you have to run to certain checkpoints with high-powered enemies before you can complete the mission, and this was actually a nice little shake-up to the formula. It was especially welcome because while this mode is a cool fresh experience after the previous story modes, it does get a bit repetitive pretty quickly. Sometimes there will be standard one-on-one -on -one fights in the series traditional style interspersed between these Naruto Warriors gameplay segments, but a vast majority of the story story is just beat em up city. Once you complete the story mode, you unlock the ability to replay the story missions as characters that you've unlocked in the shop. Speaking of, the shop is back and it's made up entirely of just purchasable characters. They can be bought for both use in the versus modes and separately for use in the story missions. Outside of that, this game brings in the tag out system where you can swap characters at any time at the cost of chakra. Unfortunately, this can only really be taken advantage of in the non-story modes, which are all basically just the same modes that we've seen previously. Outside of that, it feels, well, like the previous games. They added in a low HP stat boost system that I actually forgot to mention was in the Revolution games. Basically, when you're at low HP, your character begins glowing and they get a stat boost, and I believe for some characters it also opens up a special transformation. Other than those couple of additions though, it feels like it plays just like the previous games. Overall, I'm pretty glad that this game took a chance to shake up the formula. The highlight is definitely the new story mode mechanics, and it felt like a nice palate cleanser after playing fight after fight after fight in the previous story modes. Of course, it did get a bit repetitive to play over time, and it's not a masterpiece or anything, but it's a fun little Dynasty Warriors-esque mode, and it definitely reminds me of the story mode in Ultimate Ninja Impact on the PSP. Naruto Shippuden Gekito Ninja Taisen Special was released for the Wii in 2010. This is the final Gekito Ninja Taisen game ever made, and is also the most recent in the entire series to be released in any region. This game finally completely updates the UI and presentation a bit, and honestly, it's pretty clean. You can tell this is a way more modern UI, and I think the two-year gap from the last release probably had something to do with it. Gameplay-wise, this game does a few things differently. For starters, there's now a dedicated substitute gauge, sort of like in the Ultimate Ninja Storm games, meaning that substitutions no longer use chakra. I like this change because now you can actually sprinkle in your special moves after dodging an enemy attack rather than being forced to choose whether or not to use a substitution or take a bunch of damage, so that you can maybe get your special out. A side effect of this though is that it feels like you get your substitution way less often. Also character switching now uses this gauge too, though I think that's a more reasonable trade-off for the same reasons I just explained. A huge change 
change is that stage transitions are totally gone. I'm not sure why they chose to do this, as I thought the stage transitions were a pretty fun dynamic element to these games that gave all of the stages a bit more variety. You can still, like, slam people into walls, but I still think I prefer the stage transitions. It also looks like the stage obstacles that you can hide behind are completely removed too. What's nice though is that there are a few new stages, and the stages look nice and way more detailed than previous stages, so I guess it's a welcome change. Another change is the removal of the visible guard crush meter. While guard crush is still in the game, the meter is just gone. I assume this was to declutter the UI with the addition of the substitution gauge, and I understand why they did this, but I still liked having the guard crush meter. The weird waggle movements that you can't disable during special moves actually match your input device this time, making it way more clear what you're supposed to be pressing. I do still wish you could disable this entirely though, because honestly, I like watching the scenes rather than staring at the bottom of the screen waiting for waggle input prompts. This game doesn't have an actual story mode this time, and instead features a single player progression mode where every character has their own board game-like path. Every space on the path is an encounter, and every encounter has three possible points you can earn. The primary points are just basically for winning the fight, with the additional two points being extra objectives like winning under a certain time limit, or keeping a certain amount of HP. There's also sometimes special challenges like this one with Sasuke, where you have to defeat five single hit enemies without getting hit one time. As you earn points, extra paths open up with access to emblems, titles, and various items for stuff like the sound player mode. I assume the emblems and titles are meant for the online play, but unfortunately I wasn't actually able to play this game online. My favorite thing about this game though is just how big the cast is. There's all sorts of characters to choose from, and interestingly, it feels like a lot of them got a big moveset refresh. Characters like Sasuke feel way more fun to play, and a lot of the characters even got brand new special moves. They've also added some new characters like Sage Mode Naruto and Minato, both of whom are ridiculously overpowered. Overall though, gameplay-wise and visually, this game feels just really good to play, even with all of the feature changes and removals. It's the final game in the series, and it definitely feels like a good send-off, even if there was more content they could have covered. At the end of the day, though, this is still fun, and I didn't even really miss the story mode. What's there is essentially what you'd get with a story mode anyways, just without cutscenes. So looking at this whole series, you can see the progress that was made in the systems and the evolution of the combat mechanics. Of course, there are minor gameplay details that I probably either skimmed over or just somehow missed, but if I did a deep dive of every game, these videos would be multiple hours long. One thing I do think is worth mentioning is the fact that some characters were weirdly country exclusive, but I wasn't really sure where to include that since I didn't really focus on the rosters too much in these videos. Anyways, playing these games back to back, sometimes I would forget that I had moved on to another game. In fact, there was one point where I'd accidentally mixed up all of my footage, and the only way I could tell two of the games apart was by comparing their aspect ratios. While the games are still good games, I think that this is a series where you should probably figure out which game is the best for you, and stick with that one. In my opinion, I think my favorites are a toss-up between Clash of Ninja Revolution 3 and Gekito Ninja Tyson Special. Of course, I'm not a hardcore competitive player or anything, so I'm coming at this with a slightly different perspective. I know that Gekito Ninja Tyson 4 on the GameCube had sort of a competitive scene based on what I've read online, but I'm not sure if that's even still around in any significant way. Either way, these games are fun and I enjoyed my time with them, I just think I'm gonna take another break from Naruto games for a little while. And that's it! Thank you so much for watching! This video especially was a time sink, and your support makes it all worth it. I'm already at work on the next video, and this one is gonna be sort of along the lines of the game I just played, but different in one really specific way. You'll see. I haven't said this in a while, but if you like content like this, definitely consider subscribing, because there's a lot more coming. Anyways, again, thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a fantastic day.